Lesson 11 for June 6 to 12, The Bible and Prophecy, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 6. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that throughout your scripture, particularly in uh, the prophetic books, we have prophecy there that lets us know that you are God and that you have control over history and that you know ahead of time what's going to happen and you know that our salvation is secure and that Jesus is coming again, and that we can each have a place in that eternal kingdom. We pray that as we study this word this week, your word, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, memory text this week is Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Let's read that again, Daniel eight fourteen, And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Bible prophecy is crucial to our identity and mission. Prophecy provides an internal and external mechanism to confirm the accuracy of God's word. Jesus said in John fourteen twenty nine, And now I have told you, before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. And in John 13, verse 19, we read, Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am He. This presents a crucial question. How do we interpret prophecy correctly so that we know when the prophecy has indeed come to pass? During the Reformation, the Reformers followed the historicist method. This method is the same one Daniel and John used as the key for their own interpretation. The historicist method sees prophecy as a progressive and continuous fulfilment of history starting in the past and ending with God's eternal kingdom. This week, we will study the pillars of historicist prophetic interpretation And, as Ellen White writes in Volume 8, page 307 of Testimonies for the Church, we are to see in history the fulfilment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements, and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. Sunday, June 7, Historicism and Prophecy The foundational method that Seventh-day Adventists apply for studying Bible prophecies is called historicism. It's the idea that many of the major prophecies in the Bible follow an unbroken linear flow of history from past to present and to future. It's similar to how you might study history in school. We do it this way because that's how the Bible itself interprets these prophecies for us. Question. Read Daniel chapter 2, verses 27 to 45. What aspects of the dream indicate a continuous, uninterrupted succession of powers throughout history? In what way do we have the Bible itself showing us how to interpret apocalyptic, that is, end-time, prophecy? Daniel 2 Beginning at verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed, about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me, because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, were watching, and behold, 
a great image. This great image, whose splendour was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away, so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now... We will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But... After you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as it iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever." Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Note that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is recognized as the head of gold. Thus, Daniel identifies Babylon as the first kingdom in verse 38. Then Daniel says in verse 39, But after you shall arise another kingdom, then another, a third kingdom, and then a fourth in verse 40. That these are in succession one after another without any gaps also is implied in the image itself, for each of the kingdoms is represented in parts of a larger body moving from the head down to the toes. They are connected just as time and history are connected. In Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, instead of an image, specific beast symbols are used, but the same thing is taught. We are given an unbroken sequence of four earthly kingdoms, three in Daniel 8. They start in antiquity and go through history up to the present and into the future when Christ returns and God establishes his eternal kingdom. Thus, the image of Daniel 2 and the successive visions of Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 provided the basis for the Protestant historicist interpretation of prophecy, which Seventh-day Adventists still uphold today. Question, read John 14, verse 29. What does Jesus say that helps us to understand how prophecy can function? John fourteen twenty nine, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. So to finish today, what great advantage do we have today, living when so much history already has unfolded, that someone living in the time of Babylon would not have had? Monday, June 8, the Year-Day Principle. 
One of the interpretive keys of historicism is the year-day principle. Many scholars throughout the centuries applied this principle to the time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. They derived the principle from several key texts and from the immediate context of the prophecies themselves. Question. Read Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4 verse 6. How does God spell out the year-day principle in these specific texts? Numbers 14. 34. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, for each day you shall build your guilt one year, namely forty years, and you shall know my rejection. And Ezekiel 4, verse 6, And when you have completed them, lie again on your right side, then you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have laid on you a day for each year. In these texts, we can see very clearly the idea of the year-day principle. But how do we justify using this principle with some of the time prophecies, such as Daniel 7.25 and Daniel 8.14, as well as Revelation 11.2 and 3, Revelation 12 verses 6 and 14, and Revelation 13 verse 5? Let's look at those texts. Daniel 7. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And Daniel 8.14, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And Revelation 11 Verses 2 and 3, But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 12, verse 6, Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And verse 14, But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent, and Revelation 13, verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Three other elements support year-day principle in these prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. The use of symbols, long time periods, and peculiar expressions. First, The symbolic nature of the beasts and horns representing kingdoms suggest that the time expressions also should be understood as symbolic. The beasts and horns are not to be taken literally. They are symbols for something else. Hence, because the rest of the prophecy is symbolic, not literal, why should we take the time prophecies alone as literal? The answer, of course, is that we shouldn't. Second, Many of the events and kingdoms depicted in the prophecies cover a time span of many centuries, which would be impossible if the time prophecies predicting them were taken literally. Once the year-day principle is applied, the time fits the events in a remarkably accurate way, something that would be impossible if the time prophecies were taken literally. Finally, the peculiar expressions used to designate these time periods suggest a symbolic interpretation. In other words, the ways in which time is expressed in these prophecies, for example, the 2,300 evenings and mornings of Daniel 8.14, are not the normal ways to express time, showing us that the time periods predicted are to be taken symbolically, not literally. And so to finish today, look at the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9, 24-27. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint 
the Most Holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, and till the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week... He shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. We read that the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince in Daniel 9.25 will be a literal 69 weeks, or just one year and four months and one week. The prophecy makes no sense when understood that way, does it? What happens, however, when we apply the Bible's own year-day principle and the 70 weeks become 490 years? Tuesday, June 9. Identifying the Little Horn For centuries, the Protestant reformers identified the little horn power of Daniel 7, and in Daniel 8, as the Roman Church. Why? Question. Read Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 25, and Daniel 8, verses 1 to 13. What are the common characteristics of the little horn in both chapters? How can we identify it? Daniel 7, beginning at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked and... There was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and... There was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then, because of the sound of the pompous words, which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. 
I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed." I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom for ever, even for ever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. And I watched. And the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Thus, he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones, and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saint shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it for ever. And Daniel 8, beginning in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, after the one that appeared to me the first time. I saw in the vision, and it so happened while I was looking, that I was in Shushan, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in the vision that I was by the river Ulai. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand it. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will, and became great. And, as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west, across the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran to him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great." But when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven, and out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host, to be trampled underfoot? 
there are seven common characteristics between the little horns of Daniel 7 and 8. Both are described as a horn. That's one. Two, both are persecuting powers, as we read in Daniel 7, 21 and 25, and Daniel 8, verse 10, but also Daniel 8, verse 24, reads just like this. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive. He shall destroy the mighty, and also the holy people. 3. Both are self-exalting and blasphemous, as we read in Daniel 7, 8 and 20 and 25, and in Daniel 8, verses 10 and 11 and 25. Both target God's people, number 4, as we read in Daniel 7, 25 and Daniel 8, verse 24. And... Both have aspects, as number five, of their activity delineated by prophetic time in Daniel 7.25 and Daniel 8 verses 13 and 14. Six, both extend until the end of time in Daniel 7 verses 25 and 26 and Daniel 8 verses 17 and 19. And seven, both are to be supernaturally destroyed as in Daniel 7, verses 11 and 26, and Daniel 8, verse 25. And that reads, Through his cunning he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. History identifies the first kingdom as Babylon, Daniel 2, verse 38. The second is Medo-Persia, Daniel 8, verse 20. Let's read Daniel 2, 38 first. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. Remember, he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar here. And has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. And then Daniel 8.20, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the third as Greece, Daniel 8.21, and the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. History is unequivocal that after these world empires comes Rome. In Daniel 2, the iron representing Rome continues into the feet of iron mixed with clay, that is, until the end of time. The little horn of Daniel 7 comes forth from the fourth beast, but remains part of this fourth beast. What power came out of Rome and continues its politico-religious influence for at least 1,260 years, as we read in Daniel 7.25? Let's read that. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Only one power fits history and prophecy, the papacy. The papacy came into power among the ten barbarian tribes of Europe and uprooted three of them, as it said in Daniel 7.24. The papacy was different from the previous ones, it said in Daniel 7.24, indicating its uniqueness compared to the other tribes. The papacy spoke pompous words against the Most High, Daniel 7.25, and exalted himself as high as the Prince of the Host, Daniel 8.11 by usurping the role of Jesus and replacing it with the Pope. The papacy fulfilled the prediction of persecuting the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7.25, and casting down some of the host, in Daniel 8.10, during the Counter-Reformation, when Protestants were slaughtered. The papacy sought to change times and law, in Daniel 7.25, by removing the Second Commandment and changing the Sabbath to Sunday. And so to finish today, in Daniel 2, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8, after Greece, one power arises that exists to the end of time. What power could that be other than Rome, now in its papal stage? 
no matter how politically incorrect, why is this a crucial teaching of the three angels' messages, and hence a crucial component of present truth? Wednesday, June 10, The Investigative Judgment The prophetic outline studied this week has found overwhelming support among Protestant historicists since the Reformation, but it was not until the Millerite movement in the early 1800s that the 2300 days and the investigative judgment were carefully reconsidered and studied. Look at the following chart. The chart consists of two columns. On the left, it's headed by Daniel 7, on the right by Daniel 8. Under Daniel 7, there's Babylon, the lion, but that's blank in Daniel 8 because this vision was during the time of Medo-Persia. The second under Daniel 7 is Medo-Persia, the bear. On the right is Medo-Persia, the ram. On the left, under Daniel 7, is Greece, the leopard. On the right is Greece, the he-goat. Under Daniel 7, there's pagan Rome, the fourth beast. Under Daniel 8, in the right, is pagan Rome. The horn moves horizontally. And the last line is papal Rome, the little horn. Under Daniel 7, and under Daniel 8, it's the papal Rome. The horn moves vertically. Question. Read Daniel 7 verses 9 to 14 and Daniel 8 verses 14 and 26. What is happening in heaven as depicted in these texts? Daniel 7, beginning at verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And Daniel 8 verse 14, And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then Daniel 8 verse 26, And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. After the period of medieval persecution, which ended in 1798 with the capture and imprisonment of the Pope by Napoleon's General Berthier, uh, that's referenced actually in Revelation 13.3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marvelled and followed the beast. Daniel 7 and 8 speak of judgment. The judgment is to take place in heaven, where the court was seated, as it says in Daniel 7.10, and one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days in verse 13. This is a judgment scene that occurs after 1798 and before the second coming of Jesus. This judgment scene in Daniel 7 is directly parallel to the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14. They are talking about the same thing according to Daniel 8.14. The time of this cleansing of the sanctuary, which is Day of Atonement terminology, is 2,300 evening mornings or days. With the year-day principle, these days represent 2,300 years. 
The starting point of the 2,300 years is found in Daniel 9.24, in which the 70-week or 490-year prophecy is chatak, or cut off, from the 2,300-day vision. Uh, Let's read that in uh, Daniel 9 and verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make the reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. In fact, Many scholars correctly see the 2,300-day or year prophecy of Daniel 8.14 and the 70-week prophecy, 490 years of Daniel 9.24-27, as two parts of one prophecy. The next verse in the 70-week prophecy, Daniel 9.25, gives the beginning of the time period, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. The date for this event is the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king, as we read in Ezra 7 verse 7, or 457 BC. Counting forward 2,300 years, we come to 1844, which is not long after 1798 and before the second coming of Jesus. This is when Jesus entered the Most Holy and began his work of intercession, of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. And we'll see the chart in Friday's study. Thursday, June 11. Typology as Prophecy The symbols of apocalyptic prophecies, such as those found in Daniel and Revelation, have one single fulfilment. For example, the he-goat found its fulfilment in Greece, a singular kingdom, as we read in Daniel 8 verse 21. After all, the text came right out and named it for us. How much clearer could it be? Typology, however, focuses on actual persons, events or institutions of the Old Testament that are founded in a historical reality, but that point forward to greater reality in the future. The use of typology as a method of interpreting goes back to Jesus and the New Testament writers, and is often found in the Old Testament itself. The only guide to recognising a type and antitype is when an inspired writer of Scripture identifies them. Question. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. To what event in history does Paul refer as he admonishes the Corinthian church? How does this relate to us today? 1 Corinthians 10, beginning at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But With most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not last after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day twenty three thousand fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
Paul refers back to the historical reality of the Exodus and develops a typology based on the experience of the ancient Hebrews in the wilderness. In this way, Paul shows that God, who inspired Moses to record these events, intended that these things became our examples, as he saw in verse 6, thereby admonishing spiritual Israel to endure temptation as we live in the last days. Question. Read the passages below and write down each type and antitype fulfilment as described by Jesus and the New Testament writers. First of all, Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And John 19, verse 36, For these things were done that the Scriptures should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And John 3, verses 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And Romans 5, verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And John 1, verse 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In each case, Jesus and the New Testament writers apply the type and anti-type interpretation that allow the prophetic significance to stand out. In this way, they point to a greater fulfilment of the historical reality. And so to finish the day, think about the earthly sanctuary service, which functioned as a type of the entire plan of salvation. What does this teach us about the importance of the sanctuary message for us today? Friday, June 12. Study this chart below, and this is the same chart we had earlier in the lesson. We've got Daniel 7 on the left and Daniel 8 on the right. Daniel 7 has under it Babylon, the lion, and there's nothing under Daniel 8 because Daniel 8 occurs in the time of Medo-Persian rule. Then under Daniel 7, there's Medo-Persia, the bear, Daniel 8, Medo-Persia, the ram, Greece, for the leopard, and Greece the he-goat in Daniel 8. Pagan Rome, under 7, is the fourth beast in pagan Rome. The horn moves horizontally in Daniel 8. Papal Rome, the little horn, in 7. Papal Rome, the horn moves vertically in Daniel 8. Daniel 7, judgment in heaven. Daniel 8, cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. The crucial point to see here is that the judgment scene in Daniel 7, which occurs after 1,260 years of persecution, as predicted in Daniel 7.25, is the same thing as the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel 8.14. And this judgment scene in heaven is what leads ultimately to the establishment of God's eternal kingdom at the end of this fallen earth's sad history. Hence, we have powerful biblical evidence for the great importance that Scripture places on Daniel 8.14 and the event it signifies. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Go back and review Daniel 2. See how clearly the historicist method is revealed here. An unbroken sequence of world empires, starting in antiquity and ending with the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. God gives us the key to interpreting these prophecies. What does it say, though, about the state of the Christian world that very few Christians today employ the historicist method any more? Why does this fact help establish even more the pertinence of the Adventist message for the world at this time? 2. 
How well do you understand the 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8.14? If you don't understand it, why not take the time to learn it and share it with your class? You might be surprised at how solidly grounded our interpretation of that prophecy really is. And question 3. Read Daniel 7, verses 18, 21, 22, 25 and 27. Notice the focus on what happens to the saints. Daniel 7, beginning at verse 18. For the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. In verse 21, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. And verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. In verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Notice the focus on what happens to the saints. What does the little horn power do to them? In contrast, what does the Lord do for them? What is the good news for the saints in regard to the judgment? What does the judgment ultimately give to them? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Running for God and it's by Marianne Kazmierczak. Running brought me to church in Poland. As a young man, I started bodybuilding because the doctor cautioned me to take measures to improve my health. Then I got into long-distance running. I loved it. I ran marathons, 62-mile, 100-kilometre races, and even a 24-hour run over 126 miles or 203 kilometres. I joined a group of runners who trained together several times a week. After a while, I noticed that Poiter, a runner in our group, missed out training sessions every Saturday. I couldn't understand why, and I finally asked him. I've been thinking about the meaning of life, Poeta replied. I've been reading the Bible and I've been going to several churches to find one that follows the Bible. Now I've found such a church. Would you like to study the Bible with us? The Bible studies, led by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, confused me. I considered myself to be a devout Christian and I belonged to another denomination. One day, while we were running, Poeta shocked me with a question. Did you know that your clergy aren't telling you the truth? He said. Now you've gone too far, I exclaimed. You're mixed up. The next time we meet, I'll bring a Bible, Poeta said. You bring your church's book of doctrines. We'll see where the truth lies. The proposal seemed good to me. I'd always tried to live a truthful life and to follow the truth that I knew. At our next meeting, Poeta and I compared the two books. I was stunned to realise that my book didn't match the teachings of the Bible. Several months later, I was baptised. I was 45. It felt good to join a church whose members cared about their health. Soon, I noticed that several church members didn't eat meat. I researched the plant-based diet and also quit eating meat. Before, I saw my body as my own and exploited it for my own desires. Now I understand that my body is not my own. I try not to damage it. It is God's temple. Today I am 71, and running remains a major part of my life, although I have stopped training and competing on Sabbath. Running is an ideal way to spread the gospel. After a marathon, everyone feels good about their accomplishments, and it is easy to talk about God. I share who gives me strength to run at my age. I run at least three times a week, six miles or ten kilometres each time. It takes me about 55 minutes. I run in forests and in nature. 
I think about my life and think about God. I hum hymns and remember Bible verses. I pray for God to bring people into my path so I can talk about him. He brings people to me. And there's a photo here. Thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering in 2017 that helped build a television studio for Hope Channel in Poland, broadcasting the gospel to the Polish-speaking world. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.